Hi there, Mr. Sutton bringing you the AB Calculus 415 Extra Practice Number 4 Solutions on Advanced Related Rates. On this no calculator free response problem, we're given this y squared equals 2 plus xy curve. And the first thing they want us to do here is just to show that the derivative is y over 2y minus x. So to do that, to take this derivative, since we can't isolate y, seems like we ought to be able to, but we actually can't. Um, we're going to have to use implicit differentiation. So I'm going to just take the derivative as I normally would, but whenever I take the derivative of something with y, I'm going to have to multiply that by dy over dx, because y is now being treated as an inner implicit function of x. So going from left to right, we have 2y times dy over dx, so there it is right away, equals, well this 2 is going to be a 0 because it's a constant, um, but to do x times y we need to use the product rule, u prime v plus uv prime. So let me use the box and ribbon to organize what I'm doing with that. I have x and y and their derivatives, which are going to be 1 and dy over dx. Using the ribbon to multiply that out, I've got y plus x times dy over dx. And at this point, I have to isolate dy over dx. So I'm going to keep this dy over dx on the left side. I'm going to subtract this x dy over dx to be uh, on the left side as well. I want to get all the dy over dx's together. And I'll just leave this y where it is. So the reason I did this is because I can now factor out dy over dx, leaving me with 2y minus x on the left side. And then I can just go ahead and divide by 2y minus x to get pretty much exactly what they wanted in part A. So there we are. For this part of the problem, they want to know all points x comma y on the curve where the tangent line to the curve has a slope of 1 half. Recall from part A that our tangent line, our derivative of this curve, was given by y over 2y minus x. They gave us that for free. So we want to know all the x comma y values where this takes on a value of 1 half. Okay, well that's not so bad. Um, we just have to solve for x and y in this equation. We can start at least by cross multiplying to get rid of these fractions and then maybe we can move some things around and get rid of a variable or two. So we've got 2y minus x going this way and if we cross the other way we've got y times 2, so 2y that this equals. And now if I subtract 2y from both sides I notice that negative x equals 0, so that means that x must have a value of 0. So now if I want to figure out what the y value is, I'm going to go ahead and plug this 0 back into the original equation. So I can write y squared equals 2 plus 0 times y. And that's kind of nice because that y is just gone. So we just have y squared equals 2, which means that y is going to be positive or negative radical 2 meaning we have the point 0 comma negative radical 2 and 0 comma positive radical 2. For this part of the problem, they want us to show that there are no points on the curve where the line tangent to the curve is horizontal. So the way that we're going to do this strategically, I want to figure out the places where we could have a horizontal tangent line and then I'm going to plug those back into the original equation to show that things don't actually work out. Um, so to see where we could have a horizontal tangent line, we're going to take our derivative, which from part A again was y over 2y minus x, and set that equal to 0. The derivative needs to be 0 if I have a horizontal tangent line. And this just means that my numerator needs to be 0. So this implies that y must have a value of 0 for us to have a horizontal tangent line. Well, if y has a value of 0, what is that going to do when I plug it back into the original equation? What if I write 0 squared equals 2 plus x times 0? On the left side, I've just got 0. On the right side, I've got 2. 0 does not equal 2, so this equation will never be true for any x value. Um, therefore, that implies that we have no points with horizontal tangent lines. On this last part of the problem, we're being told now that x and y are all of a sudden functions of time, t, and are related by, well, the same equation that they gave us in the beginning. So at time 5, the value of y is 3, apparently, and dy over dt is 6. Based off this, we want the value of dx over dt at time 5. 
So since this is using multiple rates of change, we have a dy over dt and we want a dx over dt. This is a related rates problem now. And we have to take the derivative of all this stuff again, again implicitly, but this time instead of everything being a function of x, everything will now be a function of t, of time. So everything now is going to have to get its own d something over dt tail. So let's go ahead and take that derivative. Derivative of y squared, that's going to be 2y times, now we're going to write dy over dt, not dx, dt now, because it's a function of time. And then equals, 2's derivative is still 0. x times y is still going to require the product rule. So it's box and ribbon time again. And again, we have x and y. But this time around, since we're taking the derivative with respect to time, the derivative of x is now dx over dt, not just 1. Derivative of y is now, again, dy over dt. And multiplying this out with the ribbon, now we have y dx dt, or d over, dx over dt, um, plus x times dy over dt. And at this point, it's time to plug stuff in and solve for what we're missing. dx over dt is ultimately what we're solving for. So that means we need to plug something in for x, y, and dy over dt. So let's take stock of what we have so far. We've got y. We've got dy over dt. They didn't tell us x anywhere. Um, they did tell us that we're finding dx over dt at time 5. So we need to know what the value of x is at time 5. Well, we know what the value of y is at time 5. The value of y is 3. And we have an equation that relates x and y. So if I know what y is at time 5, I ought to be able to find x by just plugging the, uh, the y value into the original equation. So if y is 3, then we can write 3 squared equals 2, time, or 2 plus x times 3. So this is going to be 9 equals 2 plus 3x. And then if I subtract 2 and divide by 3, I've got 7 thirds for the x value. So now plugging everything in, we have 2 times the y value 3, they gave us that, times the dy over dt value of 6, they also gave us that, equals y value of 3 times dx over dt. Uh, the dx over dt, we're solving for that, so that's going to stay put, plus the x value of 7 thirds times the dy over dt that they gave us of 6. And we're just going to keep simplifying and try to solve for dx over dt. So on the left side, this is going to be 6 times 6, so 36. On the right side, we have 3, plus, three times dx over dt. And uh, this 6 and the 3 reduced to a 2, so 2 times 7 is the 14 we see here. Subtracting 14, that's going to give us 22. Divide by 3, we've got 22 thirds. So dx over dt then equals 22 thirds. For this calculator-based free response problem, for times 0 to 10, we have water flowing into a small tub. And the rate at which water is flowing in is given by the function big F, defined as this arctan function. And then for times 5 to 10, the water starts leaking from the tub at a rate given by this L function over here. So these are both measured in cubic feet per minute. And T is measured in minutes. Volume of the water at any given time is W of T, but they're not telling us what W of t looks like algebraically. They just gave a name to this quantity. Um, so for part A, we want at time 3, they, they're telling us there's 2.5 cubic feet of water in the tub. We want an equation for the locally linear approximation of W at time 3, and then use it to approximate uh, basically W of 3.5. So since this is a calculator problem, and I've been given two functions, one for basically a rate in, one for a rate out. I'm going to go ahead and put both of those in my y equals right now. So here I am in my y equals. I've entered the f function here as y1 and the l function, which I don't actually end up using on this problem because it doesn't come into play until we're uh, at five minutes and afterwards. Um, but I've entered that in y2 because I'm just thinking I'm probably going to need it down the road. So we'll come back to that one. Now, again, for this problem, we want to write a linear local approximation, a locally linear approximation of w at time 3. So in general, um, we've got the formula L of x equals f of a 
plus f prime of a times x minus a. It's basically your tangent line approximation. For f of a in this case, that's w of 3. 3 is kind of our launching off point for this, this tangent line that we're talking about. Um, and they told us that at time 3, the value of w is going to be 2.5. So I'm going to write, in general, w of t is approximately equal to, so this is a general linear approximation formula. We've got 2.5, that's w of 3, plus now we need w prime of 3. This is the rate of change of time at time, th or rate of change, rather, of the, uh, the volume at time 3. Now, the rate of change of the water, in general, is going to be the rate of water flowing in minus the rate of water flowing out. But at time 3, specifically, there's no water flowing out because the water doesn't start leaking out until time 5. Um, so between 0 and 5, your, your W prime, essentially, is just going to be this F function right here. So this is going to be whatever F of 3 is times, now we're just going to write uh, t minus 3. And this is only valid for times 0 to 5, but it's, it certainly is valid at time 3. So now we just have to use this to approximate t 3.5, uh, w of 3.5 uh, here. Um, so I'm going to put this in the calculator, and then I'm just going to plug in 3.5. So here I go. To do this on the calculator, I went to my y3 now. And I put in 2.5 plus, I did alpha trace and pulled up y1, and I'm plugging 3 into that specifically. So that's using this f function that I put in y1. And then you can't see it here, but I've got x minus 3 over there. Let me quit out of this now and do alpha trace and pull up y3. And I just wanted to plug in 3.5 to this because that's what they said in the problem. So 3.5. Plugging that in, pressing enter, comes out to about 2.952. And that's, that's a, uh, an amount of water. So that's going to be cubic feet of water. So 2.952 feet cubed. On this problem part, they want us to find W double prime, say that 10 times fast, of 8. So uh, let's go ahead now and define just W prime itself, and then we can just take the derivative of that on the calculator at an input of 8. So W prime, at least when you get to t equals 8, you're going to have to start thinking about the L function at that point, um, because we not only have water flowing in, but now, since you're past time 5, you've got water flowing out. So for times 5 to 10, W prime has to be defined as f of t minus L of t, rate in minus rate out. But now that we've defined it thusly, we can actually just plug 8 into the derivative of w prime on the calculator. So that's what we're going to do now without actually showing what w or double prime looks like. So here's what I have done on my calculator. I've gone back to my y equals. And in y4 now, because I've already used up all the other ones, um, I've defined a new function, y1 minus y2. This is f of t minus l of t, because I stored f in my y1 and I stored l in my y2. So this right here, essentially, y4 is w prime. Now if I exit out of there, back to the main screen, I'm going to take the derivative of w prime at 8. So let me do math 8, bring up derivative. We're going to do dx. And now I'm going to do alpha trace y4 has to go in here, because that's where I stored w prime. And now I'm going to do this at the x value 8, or the input value of 8 anyway. And that comes out to negative 0.183. Great. Uh, what units is that going to be? Because we need the units, and then we need to write a, sense in, a sentence interpreting all of this stuff. So the units of w prime, since it was based off of flow in and flow out, um, it, would be, it was going to be originally cubic feet per minute. But now we took the derivative of cubic feet per minute with respect to time. So the rate at which cubic feet per minute is changing is going to be in cubic feet per minute per minute. So this is going to be cubic feet per minute squared then. OK, so what this means, w, w, or w double prime of 8 
This is going to be the rate at which the rate of change in volume is changing. So we have a rate of change of volume, and it's also changing now at a certain rate. And this is the rate. And it's the rate it's changing in cubic feet per square minutes at time 8 minutes. On this part of the problem, they're asking if there's a time between 5 and 10 at which the rate of change of the volume of the water in the tub changes from positive to negative and give a reason for your answer. Well, probably the easiest way to answer this problem would be to actually calculate whether or not W prime, which we defined earlier, remember, as F of t minus L of t, to calculate whether this actually changes from positive to negative using our grapher and, and just identify the spot. If we can identify the spot where this happens, then that's going to answer this question with a reason. So we're going to see where this changes now from positive to negative. Let me go back to my grapher. So here I am, back in the y equals again. Now remember, I put w prime as y4, which was, again, f of t minus l of t. So I'm going to graph that out. Let me first deselect everything else, because I don't want to graph all those other things. I've got enough on my plate here. Uh, now, I need a window to graph this in. They said we're curious about 5 to 10 in terms of times. So let's go to window, and let's do x min is 5, and we'll do 10 for the x max. Back to window. Have my number lock turned off there. There we go. And now let me do zoom 0, zoom fit. And let's see what this looks like. So again, we're looking for places where this changes from positive to negative. And it looks like, yep, there's a spot that we can see on there. Now, it's not enough to say, um, you know, hey, I looked at my grapher, and I see a spot where this changes from positive to negative. Um, to, to really prove this, we want to identify what this spot is, at what time this happens. So let me go to second, trace, and then zero. And let me just click enter a little bit to the left of that intersection. Click enter again a little bit to the right. One more time for good measure. And we see that this happens at about 8.149. So t equals that. And that's in minutes. And since we've actually found a time where this condition is met, that answers the question, um, yes, there is such a time. And there it is. For this last part of the problem, we're told that this tub is in the shape of a rectangular box that's half a foot wide by four feet long by three feet deep. And we want to know the rate of change of the depth of the water in the tub at time six. So we already have a rate at which the volume of the water is changing. Now we want a rate of change of the depth of the water. This is going to be a related rates problem because we have one rate of change and we're trying to find another. So we need to set up an equation that ties all of this together and then take the derivative with respect to time. That'll give us access to those different rates of change. So what formula ties all this together? Well, how about a formula for the volume of the water? Because, I mean, that's what is changing in this problem along with the depth of the water. So we can say that volume of water in general, uh, since the water is going to conform to the shape of the tub, the water is going to be in the shape of a rectangular prism as well. So we can write length times width times height. But we can say a little bit more, because these are not all going to be changing. The water has to take on the width and the length of the tub. The only thing that's changing with the water, really, is how deep it is. But everything else is staying the same. So we have a length of 4 and a width of, they said, let's see, 5.5. So 4 times 0 0.5 is really just going to be 2. So our volume, then, of the water is just going to be 2 times the height. That'll tell us how many cubic feet of water we have. OK? So we can actually take the derivative of v equals 2h pretty easily with respect to time. That's going to be dv over dt equals 2 times dh over dt. Ultimately, we want to know the rate of change of the depth of the water. So we're looking for dh over dt. That means we need to plug in something for dv over dt. This is the rate at which the volume of the water is changing at time 6. Well, how do we find that? If only we had a function for the rate of change of volume. In fact, we do. We saw in part c that for times 5 to 10, where we have some leaking going on here, our rate of change, w prime, is f of t minus l of t. 
And I've actually already got this entered in my calculator now as y4. Um, so we can write here, instead of w prime of t, we can write, or del instead of dv over dt, we can write w prime of 6 equals 2 times dh over dt. And now I just have to calculate w prime of 6, divide it by 2, and I've got my number that I'm looking for. So to the calculator we go. So as I said a moment ago, I stored w prime as y4 on my calculator. So I'm just going to plug 6 into that and divide by 2. And that's going to come out to 0 0.250. And since this is depth we're talking about, this is going to be uh, in rates of feet per, let's see here, what was the, the time units again? Minutes, feet per minute. So 0.250 feet per minute. We got to nail the units.